gulls, geese, and black vultures. Livy, the great Roman historian, was only 15, four years younger than Octavian when the civil war broke out that was to destroy forever the Roman Republic. The first battle took place in Cisalpine Gaul, the Roman province in which he lived. That was really northern Italy and is much more civilized than the larger, wilder Gaul across the Alps, which is now France. On this side of the Alps, the Gauls had been adopted Roman customs. They wore the toga instead of their queer breeches, cut short their yellow hair instead of letting it grow long, and many had given themselves Roman names. Young Livy, however, was not a Gaul, but an Italian. For the past 200 years, Italian settlers from southern Italy had been sent up here to Cisalpine Gaul to form a strong pioneer colony between Rome and the barbarians. Chopping down the tall trees for their fields and vineyards, these pioneers had cut great squares of sunshine into the deep wooded valley of the Po. But young Livy was not of that pioneer or farmer stock. The boy was city bred. He had been born in a fine house in Padua, where his family had lived for many generations. They prided themselves their city was as old as Rome. Padu, Padua, like Rome, they said, had also been settled by Greek refugees from burning Troy. As a small boy, Livy had loved to listen to the story of the Trojan War and to hear how the hero Aeneas had escaped with his band of followers and finally landed on the Tiber. That was long before Rome existed, except as a little camp or village, because Aeneas was the early ancestor of Romulus, by whom Rome was founded. The story of Romulus and Remus. That, too, was a wonderful story for a small boy to hear, though at times he might wonder if it could all be true. The cruel uncle who had thrown the twin babies into the Tiber seemed real enough. But if the god Mars had truly been their father, why hadn't he protected them? And why didn't the good shepherd who had rescued them have his wife care for the poor little fellows instead of leaving them to a wolf? Yet people from Padua who had been to Rome said they had seen the actual cave of the wolf with an iron statue in it showing the wolf mother nursing the twin babies. It was on the side of the Palatine Hill Livy always planned some day to go see it. Then he could also go to the top of the hill, and that was where the twelve black vultures had come swooping down from heaven and circled over the head of Romulus to show him that it was he and not Remus who was to found the city of Rome. Twelve black vultures that had never been seen again. And the Capitoline. That was another hill to visit with another exciting story. This one was about the Gauls and how 360 years or so after Rome was founded, a terrible horde of those big blue-eyed barbarians had come pouring over the Alps and sweeping down into Italy so fast they had taken Rome by surprise. Without even stopping to shut the city gates, the Romans had fled with their wives and children to the fortress of the Capitoline. Through the wide-open gates, then, the Gauls had come pouring in, plundered, sacked, and burned the city, and very nearly captured the capital. In that extremely steep hill, they had discovered a gully, or tunnel, through which, one starlit night, they managed to creep up, so silently as to wake neither the watchmen nor the dogs. But they could not get by the geese. Those sacred geese of Juno in her nearby temple woke with such a gabbing and clapping of their wings that the sleeping Romans were on their feet at once. Jumping into action, they assailed the invaders with javelins and stones, and soon the whole company lost footing and were flung headlong to destruction. Since then, no army of Gauls had ever reached Rome again. Instead, Roman legions had gone over the Alps into the Gauls' own country to overwhelm and conquer them. One of Livy's earliest memories was of hearing about Julius Caesar, who then, summer after summer, was leading his soldiers against those wild tribes of Gaul across the Alps. Finally, the year had come when the last and greatest leader of the Gauls, brave young 
Vercingetorix had been led back to Rome in chains to walk in Caesar's triumph, and all of Gaul was under Roman rule. One winter, soon after he had learned to read, Livy had unrolled a brand new book that Caesar had just written about his war in Gaul. It began with the words, Gallia est omnis divisa in patres tres. Spellbound, he had read through to the very end. Caesar had then seemed to the boy Livy, not unlike those brave, bold, early Roman heroes who had built up the city and helped make Rome mistress of the world. But later, when Caesar had so boldly crossed the Rubicon River, when he had marched on Rome and overthrown the government, he seemed no longer a great man, but a traitor to the Republic. Then, for the first time, the boy had realized how good and bad can be blended together in one single man and in the story of a nation. That thought Livy was to put down in the introduction of his great history of the Roman people, which he was to write in future days. That is what makes the study of history so valuable, he was to say. The fact that you can behold, displayed as on a monument, every kind of conduct. Thence you may select for yourself and for your country that which you may imitate. Thence nor note what is shameful in the undertaking and shameful in the result which you may avoid. Much that was utterly shameful, young Livy was to see in this civil war that now, in his sixteenth year, was just beginning.